And you're also. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're now recording. Say, you're also you're also welcome to contact me privately afterwards. I'm going to give you my email. So if you have a private question that you'd like to ask me separately, then you could just go ahead and email me about it. Okay. All right. So this is my travel altar, uh, flying flying through the sky in a picture taken out an airplane window. But I liked this picture because. The point of travel altars is that you get to take your spiritual show on the road, whatever that means to you. And part of the reason that creating a travel altar is so exciting is that you have to decide what your spiritual show is. And it's a lot like packing for a trip. You can't take all of your wardrobe on a trip. So you have to decide what am I going to do on this trip? How am I going to enjoy it? What do I need to take with me? What are my essential elements? And creating a travel altar kind of forces you to do the same thing. And that's why it's a great vehicle for personal growth. Um, I was terrified the first time I created a travel altar because I was just terrified to actually go public and like worship in public and, and do my divination and do my thing. And it really helped me realize that I was like, I was kind of stuck in my bubble. And so I really remember the first day I went to the park with my travel altar and my heart was like beating and it was so exciting. But it really has helped me say, you know what, I think there's a place for me in the outside world. And so I'm hoping that if you haven't created a travel altar and you consider doing it, that that might be true for you as well. Um, there we go. Okay, have you ever felt like this? There's gotta be a way to connect more deeply with my higher self or my divine source. I know I've been doing X, Y, Z for this many years, but I just feel like there should be more. Or perhaps I've got internal obstacles I have to overcome. I enjoy doing this stuff, but every time I step out of my comfort zone and think about doing this new thing, oh, I don't feel so great about that. Or I hear this voice saying, that's a bad idea, or nobody will love you if you do this. Or maybe you want to improve the fit with the real you. Maybe you feel like, well, I've been doing these things other people recommended, or I've been doing the things my faith community recommended or I've been doing the things that I grew up with, but it doesn't really feel like the real me. Or maybe you're feeling fill in the blank icky emotion about practicing outside of your safe space. I feel uncomfortable. I feel like it's weird. I feel like people are gonna look at me funny, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is you might be feeling. And I'm not at all saying that you have to practice outside of your safe space. And there are some spaces where it's not appropriate to practice and some places in the world where it's not really not safe to practice. So this isn't saying that you should feel totally comfortable practicing your worship experience in the middle of a war zone or you know wherever it is that you're doing. But the point is if there's something inside of you that's just feeling like I, I feel constrained and I don't feel like I can go out in, my, in a place that should be safe or in a place where I wanna practice and step out there, then creating a travel altar might definitely be the right practice for you. Um, I want to mention, by the way, that I used a Ramadan themed slide deck as my basis for this, which is why we have stars and, and people in headscarves and things like that. I'm hoping that what I'll give you today is good for people from any faith background. If anything that I say conflicts with your faith background, feel free to decide that you do not want to adopt it. Um, but, uh, but I'm hoping to provide something for everybody, something for beginners, something for more advanced people too. Okay, and my my apologies to anybody who is from this faith background. If I have used anything in a way that's offensive, please feel free to let me know privately and I will learn from my experience. Um, honestly, I liked all the moon and stars. <laughs> that's I chose. All right, so how could a travel altar help you, right? Portable stability. So maybe you're feeling a little uncomfortable about practicing your worship or your divination or whatever you're doing. But if you have a little portable thing with all your favorite stuff, it's kind of like a little spiritual blanket, something you can take with me, with you that you're familiar with. Um, it also helps you refine your identity. As I say, you got to figure out what's important to me. What do I want to take with me? What do I really need to have with me to do my spiritual practice, whatever that is? And we're going to talk about that more along the way. Um, I personally believe when you create a travel altar, you are asking for the universe to bless you. You're saying, these spiritual practices are to me. I am taking steps. I am putting an effort. I am thinking about this to really like take my, my, my practice to the next level. And I, I, this is personal belief. I think spirit blesses you when you do that. I personally also think that this is changing the world. 
because when you say, I'm going to take my spiritual practice to the park or on vacation or to the coffee shop, you're taking a stand. You're like putting your stamp on the world. And I think if you're doing that in a positive way, that's a great, great thing. Um, and then I think the other thing is you're announcing, I want to connect. I don't want to be stuck in that place anymore where I'm like, there's got to be a better way to connect. I don't want to be stuck in that place where I'm like, this doesn't really feel like the real me. And I think that when you announce, I want to have a deeper spiritual connection, then the universe blesses you back by providing resources for that. All right, does anybody have any questions they want to ask or comments they want to make about this so far? Yeah. You know, Robin, That's just good. for our for our brand brand new people, um, maybe explain just briefly what an altar means to you. Okay. Can I table that and get there in just a few seconds? Sure. Yes, I totally can. What's coming next? In my, I've got to remember my presentation. Okay. So there's a spot in the presentation coming up that basically is like, what is an altar? And what do we do with one? So I think I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and then and then we'll get to that spot. So but thank you for asking. Yeah, okay. All right, so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about me so that you guys would know me. But also then when we get to my travel altar, you can see how it fits me, which hopefully we'll figure out how a travel altar could fit you. So my background, I come from what I call the expanded Christian tradition, which basically means that I was part of a pretty mainstream type Christian church for 25 years, and then had some experiences that were not so mainstream within the purview of my church. And, and then I had to expand. Um, I was also an SAT tutor for 20 years, which was great in learning how to work with people, but it left me feeling like I was kind of part of the machine in a way that wasn't so comfortable. And then I also love buying things at thrift stores and making beautiful outfits. And I mentioned this partly so you'll know me, but partly because these things imbued what I wanted to do with my travel altar. I had came from this expanded Christian tradition, so I wanted a deeper divine connection. In tutoring people for the SAT, I felt like I was helping my clients, but not with something that I really cared about. So I wanted something that really was deeply meaningful to me in helping others. And then I have this like penchant for making things. I just, I love making things. So my travel altar had to reflect that too. And I have a couple pictures of my thrift store outfits here, which I just put up so that you can see why my slide deck is so detailed and colorful. <laughs> That's kind of my style. But the point is, your your uh, travel altar will reflect your style, whatever that is. And it's important for you to start thinking about what that style is so that there's a nice tight fit between you and the uh, the travel altar that you eventually do create. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Beliefs and connection. The travel altar is not designed to sit on your shelf and gather dust. It's supposed to actually help you like connect with your spiritual source, whatever that is. Practicals for putting together a travel altar. Uh, we're gonna do a little tour of my altar so that you can see what's in it, which hopefully will be inspiring to you. Then we're gonna have some how-tos for things you can make yourself for your travel altars. And then at the end, we're gonna go through some keys to success and there'll be a chance to ask questions and stuff like that. So this is generally where we're, where we're headed. Now, Ari had an excellent question, which is, what is an altar? Why do I need one? What does it mean to me? So this is the dictionary definition, a table or place which serves as a center of worship and ritual. Um, and just so you know, I know that my slides are quite detailed here. Anybody who's visually impaired, I'm reading everything that's on the slides. So you won't, you won't end up missing anything. Anyway. So yeah, that's what an altar is. It's the center of your worship or your ritual. And we could expand that to say your spiritual connection or your divination practices or whatever it is. It's like a little mini suitcase, a travel altar, with all of your favorite tools, um, connection talismans, images that make you feel connected, anything that you need to get into that space of spiritual focus for yourself. So for me, my travel altar is a little mint tin, which I'll uh, have it here and I'll show you guys at the end. 
And basically I just stick it in my purse or I stick it in the back pocket of my jeans every time I go on a hike. And that way I know that if I'm on my hike or I'm walking in the river, or I'm in the park, and all of a sudden I feel like, you know, I wanna, I wanna do a reading and connect, or I wanna do a little ritual, I can just pull out all of my favorite tools and they're all there. So in addition to having a beautiful walk in the park or a lovely hike, I also have the ability to use these tools to supercharge that spiritual connection and come away with new insight, a new feeling of peace, release of negative emotions, whatever it is. It's like for those of us who like actual tools, like to get our hands on things or like the spiritual safety blanket of familiarity, you've got stuff that will trigger that spiritual connection for you. And then if it's a travel altar, of course, it's full. So you can take it wherever you want. Did that answer your question, Ari? Or do you have other questions you want to ask about that? That was good. All right. Does anyone else have questions about that? I can't That's see true. all of you. So either raise your, put it in the chat or raise your reaction hand, please. I think we're good to go. All right, great. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about what spiritual connection with an altar is because this is where we start thinking about how we can create an altar that really fits us and meets our spiritual needs. And this is where the spiritual growth comes in. So I have this concept that I call AID. I made this up, it's not an official concept, but AID stands for accessing your inner divine connection. And I would like this to be something that is broadly applicable. So this could be your higher self, it could be something that you label as God, it could be a spirit guide, it could be an ancestor, it could be your spirit animal, it could be some specific aspect of divinity that you want to connect with. Whatever that is that makes you feel like you're experiencing your spiritual connection in a way that really is meaningful to you. And so the first thing is, who or what am I connecting with or worshiping? Some people don't like the word worship, you could say making a connection to substitute whatever word is meaningful to you here. But I'd like you all just to take a moment. And if you are the type who would like to write something down and just think to yourself, close your eyes and think, what am I wanting to connect with? And this might be something that you're already connecting with. Maybe you already have this, or maybe you're like, am I yearning for more of a connection? Like, I realized that I was connecting a lot with my divine source, but I wasn't connecting as much with my inner self. I was out of balance in a personal way. I was always looking to the divine source to tell me what to do and I wasn't really connected to me. Um, so take a moment and you can either think about this or just write something down. What would you like to be connecting with in your travel altar? Okay, and then our next question is, how do I want my travel altar to help me experience this? Take a moment and see what occurs to you. And this could be a how, like I want it to be fun. I want it to be easy. I want it to be spontaneous or it could be how like, I wanna connect with my tarot cards, or I wanna connect with my pendulum, or I wanna connect with herbs. Or maybe it's a feeling, I want it to be peaceful, or, or, or a result, I want it to be transformative. And don't forget to be aspirational here. This isn't just about recreating, or I should say, it doesn't have to be just about recreating your regular altar. It could also be about thinking, what are my next steps? What would I like to be experiencing that I'm not yet? yet? Okay, and you guys can always obviously come back and think about this more. I don't, I don't want to take too long, but 
Uh, but yeah, but this is part of figuring out where is my altar taking me, not literally taking me, like it's taking me to the park, although we'll think about that. But like in my next spiritual growth stage, where is this altar taking me? And then I just have a couple of recommendations at the bottom. This is from personal experience and important maybe for those of you who may not have worked with altars before or might be new to spiritual connection. It is possible to end up connecting to spirits, for lack of a better term, that don't necessarily have your highest or best interest at heart. I don't want to freak anybody out. I don't feel like you'll be possessed by making a travel altar or anything like that. But sometimes people hear voices, you know, or get ideas or or see a quote unquote, a sign. And, and it's not always coming from a place of love or expansion or the highest vibration. So it is really important to make sure that whatever you're connecting with is something, and this, these are my three tests, just personal tests. Is it full of love? Is it encouraging and positive? And is it helping to send you in a direction that's for your best interest and best growth? And so if I ever get any ideas or, or hear voices or whatever that don't seem like that's what they're doing, they're not encouraging or positive, they don't have my best interest at heart, they're not constructive, they don't feel full of love, then I'm just like, you know what, I'm going to release that. That's not what I want to, that's not what I want to connect with. Um, and then also it's, of course, always fine to ask people who you respect spiritually and get some outside opinions on whether they think what you're connecting with is really for your highest benefit or not. Okay, and then the other thing is to set some protections. So this might be something as simple as just saying, I don't want to connect with any spirits that are not here for my highest benefit. Or some people like actual protections where they have like little rings of salt or they put a sacred circle down. Or some people will envision themselves and surrounded in a bubble of light. My point here is not really to be an expert in different types of protections. If you wanna Google them or ask spiritual practitioners about them, you certainly can. But it's always a good idea to create a positive constructive space for yourself and your worship activities. And you may have one of those already set up at home with your candles and your sage and your salt or whatever. But if you're traveling, you might need to take some, some time either to physically do some things to create that or to just create it in your mind with your own energy when you're at a foreign country or you're in the park or you're at somebody else's house. All right, anybody wanna ask anything about that? Any questions on, on that? All right, so these are important because an altar is both a physical place, but it's also a mental place. Now I say mental, mental, emotional, energetic. It's a physical spot, but it's also a metaphysical spot. So here's a little picture of me using my altar uh, at the park, <laughs> my local park. It's got, this, this is my sacred space, by the way, is to put my four buttons in the corners of my altar. Um, I don't unpack my altar because I'm typically at the park and it's messy, but some people do that. But I just I just use the lid of my altar as creating a little space right here. And we'll take a look at those buttons a little bit more closely later. Um, so what you want to be thinking about is from a tool perspective on the physical side, what are the tools I already use in my worship or connection? And what new tools do I want to explore? So we're gonna take another moment. You can grab your pen and paper and think for a sec. What do you already use that you really enjoy? And is there anything on your heart? Is there anything on your heart that you would like to explore? And you might have had a long time desire to explore something new or something might pop into your head right now. Just write it down. You don't have to do it. Just write it down. It's just a pencil and paper. You're not committing to anything. Good to write it down. And I see your question there, JJ. We'll definitely, definitely get to that. All right. And then here is the mental, mental, emotional, metaphysical side. What are the beliefs I have? that I want to transform? Do I want to feel more confident? Do I want to feel more peaceful? Do I want to feel more flexible in the way that I connect? Am I stuck in a rut and I'd like things to be able to be more fluid? 
And then also, which beliefs do I have that are serving me well that I want to double down on? That I want to um, encourage? And which beliefs are limiting my growth? Take a moment and think about that. Now, when we talk about beliefs that limit your growth, I, again, want to revolve back to our awkwardly Zen. You do you, we are not doctors or medical, I'm not, a, I'm not a medical professional. There are some limiting beliefs that are valuable, like the belief that maybe says, I shouldn't jump off this building because I cannot fly. That's a limiting belief and I would suggest you keep it. Or another example is it's really a good idea to look both ways before you cross the street. Does that limit your exploration? Yes, a tiny bit, but for your own good, right? But there may be some beliefs as you look inside of yourself or you come back and think about this or you ask your spiritual connection for guidance later where you're like, you know, I feel like maybe I'm ready to let that one go. Or this one is rubbing me in a way that feels like it needs some adjustment. Making a travel altar is about getting out into the world, expanding your boundaries, taking your practice to a new location. And as a result, it's a great time to just, you know, it's the, it's the song, Shake It Off. I don't know who sings the Shake It Off song, but it is a great chance to shake things off if you're thinking that you would like to, you would like to grow. Okay, so I want to have um, a moment for some sharing here. Um, I can share. So one of the beliefs that I shook off was people will look at me weird if I have my travel altar in the park which wasn't so much a limiting belief because they might be looking at me weird. But I guess the limiting belief was like, it will be a tragedy if people look at me weird while I'm in the park. Because I'm like, you know what? I love my little park and I'm not doing anything wrong. And if somebody looks at me funny, I think I can take it. And maybe they will ask me what I'm doing and I'll get a chance to share about my spiritual beliefs. And that actually could be kind of cool. So I realized I had to shake that off. And then for me, the tool I already loved was my um, Lenormand cards. So I'm like, I got to find a way to fit 41 Lenormand cards into a mint tin, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. So those are some of my beliefs and, and tools that I really wanted. Does anybody have anything that they want to share that has come to them? Don't, no pressure to share anything that's uncomfortable for you. Robin, could you stop sharing for just one second so we can see the screen? That'll make it easier for me to see if people have the ability to share. Yay. Perfect. Uh, all right. Anyone want to share about some of those questions? Any tools using that you want to keep or any beliefs that you want to you want to continue or you want to shake off well i will say that um tools that i use that i will absolutely keep always um i always have this little bell with me because sound is really important for for changing energy and raising frequency and then i always have these three essential oils with me um and they will always go with me everywhere because Perfect. They do awesome things. And with you on the bell, this is my bell from a 1970s cruise ship, which I found at a thrift store. So bells of the world unite. Okay, anybody else have anything that they want to share about? If not, we can keep going. I'm not seeing anyone jumping up and down ready to share. So I think you can keep All going. Right. Remember to share your All screen right. again. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, wait, and don't forget JJ's question. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can ask, okay, so JJ, your question is, what if we, what if you are not sure what to call it yet or anymore if your journey is new? So are you asking whether, whether it's important what you call it? I feel like no. I feel like from my perspective, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Go ahead. Go ahead. The question I had was uh, when you were talking about the actual worship and um, mm -hmm. calling on what you were praying to or worshiping, and I'm kind of in between Christianity and spirituality right now, so uh -huh. I'm not a hundred percent 
positive or confident in what or who I should be calling on. So I'm just kind of confused because I'm in the between stage. Right. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for, for that question and for sharing honestly about your between stage. I'm totally, totally with you in this between stage. I get it. So this is my personal belief, which is that that spirit or the positive forces in the universe are not super hung up on being called exactly the right thing. You know, it's kind of like the, um, what, I, what is that? It doesn't matter what you call me, just don't call me late for dinner concept. Generally speaking, yeah, spirit exactly. is so happy, yeah, so happy to, that we're calling on spirit at all, that we want to connect, yeah. that we're paying attention, that we're listening, that using the right they will know label. Who. Yeah, That's they exactly won't know right. that and I'm addressing it, them, right? Yes, and the, yes, and so you have a couple of options. Sometimes people like labels, and so you can make up a label if you want, and just say, "I'm not sure who you actually are, but the name Amanda fills me with love and joy, and I'm going to just call you Amanda." Yeah. Or you can say, "Is there a name that you would like to call me by?" I'm sorry, you would like me to call you by, and you might okay. hear something, or you might see a sign, or you might say. I'm just going to call you my helper until something better occurs to me. Okay. Like, yeah, if you want a name and you care about one, just ask. Right. It's hard for me when I was raised in church and church and grew up in church and even went to church in my young adult years. You know, you pray to God, you pray to Jesus. That's all. That's mm -hmm. it. And I'm just mm -hmm. not not there anymore. So it's just kind yeah. of confusing. Yeah. No, but I, uh, I had, but you're, no, you're very welcome. I appreciate your asking. I had that very same problem at the beginning when I, when I, when I stepped away from the, the church that I was a part of. Um, and I just, I realized I still call, I still call my divine source God, but I just feel like the divine loves us so much that it's kind of like, I don't know if you ever listen to what little kids call their parents. It's pretty rare that little kids call their parents by their actual official given names. There's almost always some sort of fond nickname and you can just create one. That's my, that's my belief. But maybe one will come to you at some point, you know, as things evolve. Okay, great question. Thank you so much for asking. Anybody Thank else you. have anything they wanna, they wanna ask about? Okay. All right, so, oops, what's going on? Oh, right, oh, this is the accessing the inner divine. Sorry, I switched the slide order. Okay, that's what eight is. So uh, when we start talking about steps for creating travel altars, which we're going to get to in a little bit, um, and you see a step labeled aid, that's the special step for accessing your inner divine. Okay, so for those of you who have not used an altar before, we're just going to go quickly through my idea of the five steps of what to do with your altar. Okay, now I have this altar. I've never made an altar before, but the class sounded cool. Here I am in the park with my altar. What do I do now? So this is completely based on my own ideas and you should feel free to um, uh, fuss with it and experiment and, and tweak it for your own purposes. Okay, step one is to focus. This is part of the point of the altar is to have something to focus on. And so your altar may include, your, your practice may include a moment for setup where you're like putting out your your sacred circle, unpacking your goodies, putting out your rune buttons. And so there's physical steps to focusing of setting up your little, your little scenario, whatever it is. Or there may also be mental and emotional steps where you close your eyes, you take some deep breaths, you let your to-do list drain away, you stop thinking about going shopping later, you decide you're gonna table your worries about that weird conversation you had with somebody earlier in the day, this is a moment where you're creating a bubble that's devoted to you and your divine connection and your spiritual practice, whatever that is. So take a moment to focus and set up your space however you want it set up, okay? Then it's really important to take some time to establish that connection. And this time could be 30 seconds if you're doing something super fast or you connect like that, or you could take a lot longer time depending on how much time you have and what your practice is like. So reach out in your mind with your heart to whatever it is you wanna connect with. And that could be your spirit guides, your divine connection, 
the, the nameless source you don't have a name for, but you feel like it's out there, or your higher self, your inner self, um, a spirit animal, whatever it is. And you connect, connect, in my opinion, to something very general. You can just say, all right, I'm open to the blessings and the wisdom that the universe has to give me. I think, I think whatever works for you is fine. All right, this is a really important step that a lot of people skip. And we're gonna talk about why people skip it and how that causes problems in a second. But I think it's important to let the purpose of your practice or your moment kind of like bubble up from inside of you or come to you from your outside sources, again, depending on what your practice looks like. Why are you here in the park doing this little thing or in your hotel room on your trip setting up your ritual? What are you trying to accomplish from this? And you might know it in your mind. Okay, I'm trying to calm down from this crazy day I have. Or I'm trying to cleanse off this energy that, that I accumulated at Thanksgiving dinner. But I think it's also important to take a moment to say, is there a purpose that maybe I'm not aware of yet? I think I'm here to cleanse this energy. Maybe I'm also here to reconnect with myself and just take that time to see if anything bubbles up inside of you. And if nothing does, that's perfectly fine. But that's part of making an altar, not just about your activities, but increasing the connection with whatever source you're trying to connect with. Okay, then it's the time for beginning your ritual, whatever it is that you're doing. And this is the ask, release, replace. So it's a three part step. You're asking for whatever you want. You wanna cleanse off the energies. You want wisdom from your divination. You want to feel more peaceful, whatever it is. But very often the purpose, like the act of asking for something to come in may require that you let something else go to replace it. So for example, if you're asking for greater peace, you may need to notice the tension in your shoulders or the heartbeat in your chest or the angry thoughts about Aunt Mabel and her comment at Thanksgiving dinner and let those guys go so that you're making space for this peace to come in. So ask for whatever you're trying to achieve in your practice and don't forget to release whatever needs to go to make space for that and replace the two of them. If you don't release it, you may try to layer your piece on top of your anger against Aunt Mabel, and then you have a bad foundation and the piece won't really take as deeply as it could. And then the final step is to respond to whatever arises in this process. So as you're asking for greater peace and you're releasing the anger for Aunt Mabel, you may feel part of you that's like, I'm not letting Aunt Mabel off the hook. Her comment was outrageous. And you're like, okay, part of me is resentful against Aunt Mabel and doesn't want to let this go. So then you have to respond to that and you may have to go back to that release stage or ask yourself why it is that you feel like Aunt Mabel should pay for her anger and you're not allowed to, to let it go somehow. Or maybe you're asking for some sort of wisdom and you're doing a reading and you're like, oh, wow, this reading is really telling me I've got to talk honestly with my boss. And then you're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to talk to my boss. Then you got to respond to that. Don't just like get this information and then walk away. If you need help working through those process, or maybe you need to make a plan for talking to your boss, or maybe you're like, I can't do this on my own. I got to call my best friend and get some help for what to say to my boss. Like decide how you're going to take this process and move forward with it. And this generally will allow you to get greater transformation from the activities that you have with your altar. Okay. Um, all right, anybody have anything they wanna ask for about what I've said so far? Feel free to just unmute yourself if you need to. Okay. So if you are having trouble with, oh, sorry, that was the last thing. Okay, yeah, so be willing to experiment. You can always adjust. Nobody gets it perfect the first time out. Everybody has at that time where they're like, well, I tried this and it didn't work very well. And that's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be right the first time. Okay, so if you're having trouble in your manifestation practice or your altar doesn't work the way you want it to, or you keep asking for stuff and it's not happening, it may be because, oh wow, okay. I'm sharing this on a Mac and my alignment is slightly off here. What I meant to say is that if you're, if you're having trouble with manifestation or your altar practice isn't satisfying, 
or you keep manifesting things you don't want, or you manifest stuff that you thought you wanted, but then it doesn't make you happy. It may be that you are skipping to the ask and release, you're skipping to the ask step and you haven't actually done steps one, two, or three. And that's what typically happens when we end up manifesting stuff that doesn't make us happy is that we haven't really connected. We haven't really sensed our inner purpose. Or if you're having trouble manifesting anything, you may not have released stuff. You may be asking and trying to layer things on top of parts of you that you actually need to let go. So this is just like a little troubleshooting hint. Do not skip steps one through three, especially if somehow you feel like you're hitting a roadblock or your spiritual practice isn't right, isn't quite changing your life or you the way you really want it to. Okay. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to ask about here? Um, yeah, Robin. Um, yeah. Uh, I would ask, um, I know it's a lot of um, space to add uh, onto this. I, well, in addition to what Jilly put in, uh, or sorry, what uh, JJ put in the chat, or Jilly put in the chat. Sorry. I, Oh, give thanks. Uh, yes, brain. Yeah, great stuff. Um, uh, about <laughs> giving thanks, and I don't know. Azrael yeah. put it as a ze step, step zero, zero, maybe yeah. either either one. Giving thanks, but um, I don't know whether or not this uh, this particular slide is part of your um, uh, downloaded. Uh, uh, a uh, document the that the uh -huh. worksheet that's available, but this would be super, super helpful um, to be able to have just to, because it it's um, impossible to, well, I don't wanna say it's impossible to take a screenshot um, of it right now, uh, but it's if, difficult. If you email, if you, I'll, I'll, I'll just email you a copy. Okay, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate anybody it. Anybody who wants a copy of this, just email me and say, please send me a copy of that slide. <laughs> okay, yes, <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. I had to email you anyways. Okay, thank you. Never mind. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and I, t I love the idea of adding thanks, Jilly. I will definitely add that to, to this. And I want to mention that it doesn't have to be in this order necessarily. Like, you know, you're welcome to connect at any stage in the process. I just wanted to provide like a no, basic I, framework I, for people to be thinking I about. I just love the framework. That's why I didn't want to, yeah. Uh, Great. Yeah, I just Yay. didn't want to forget it. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like it. Okay. Good. Wow. That makes me feel awesome. Okay. I'm glad I incorporated this. All right. Anybody else want to unmute and make a comment before we, we move on? Okay. Oh, I got a heart. How sweet. I love that. Okay. All right. So um, this is just my, this is, again, this is my, my, my next two cents on using your altar. And then we're going to, we're going to get to the actual practicals in just a few minutes. Okay. Courageous sharing opens the door to authentic connection. Um, I personally believe oops, that you have to balance respect and honesty. It's really, and I don't know why my honesty, why my why is at the end, it really should say honesty, but I think it's really important to respect our spiritual connection and to, you know, be thankful and grateful for the input that we get and the love that we receive. But I also think it's really important to say, you know what, I am ticked right now because it doesn't seem like you're listening to me at all. I don't know why this stupid altar doesn't work the way I want it to work. I spend hours worshiping and nothing good ever happens to me. And we know that those things aren't actually necessarily true. Obviously, anybody who has a computer and can like log into this uh, class has lots of blessings. But, but sometimes we feel that stuff and I think you just gotta let it out. So there's that balance between respect, but if you're not honest about what you're really thinking and feeling, I think that it worship is like layering pretty icing on top of an icky tasting cake. It just, it just doesn't really work out. You have a smile on your face there, Ari. <laughs> I can see it. I know. It took me a while. I, I was, you know, being in the church for 25 years, it was hard for me to tell God I was really ticked. But I discovered that he really appreciates that honesty. And he's like, oh, now this is getting good. Now we're getting honest. Now we can talk about what's really going on. So, okay. All right. So checking in. 
these are just some questions that you might think about here. Is there anything in you that is concerned about going public with a travel altar? Part of you that's like me, I was like, what if people look at me weirdly when I'm in the park? Is there anything that I've said, which might or might not even agree with it, but you're like, wow, that was really challenging. Take a moment and feel free to write something down. Even if it hit you the wrong way and you don't agree with me at all, maybe thinking about why it hit you the wrong way will help you to do a little growth on your own. I feel fill in the blank about my path. You might be like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. This is great. Or you might be like, I'm terrible. I don't worship enough at all. I don't even have an altar. We all feel all kinds of things about this. This is my take on, on travel altars. The world will benefit from your beliefs and you and your divine connection will create the right meaning for you, whatever that is over time. It's okay if it's not perfect right away. It's okay if it's an evolving process. It's okay if you try something and it's totally not you and you have to go back to the drawing board. You and your divine connection will figure this out. And I think if you're interested in travel altars, it's worth working through whatever you're feeling because I think that the world needs more people who bring their beautiful beliefs into the world in a respectful and positive, but in a, I will not be silenced kind of way. So take a moment, write down anything here that might be resonating with you or that you wanna come back to think about later. Take a screenshot and we're gonna get into the practicals of creating a travel altar. Okay. All right. Anybody want to ask any last questions before we dive into actually how to make one? Okay. All right. And I appreciate your patience with going through the, what am I doing with my travel altar part first, because this is really the foundation that you need to really enjoy your travel altar. Somebody mentioned that she'd ordered several travel altars off of Etsy. Yay for supporting Etsy artisans, right? That was great. But that she wasn't entirely satisfied with using them. And so it may be that going through this process of figuring out what am I even doing with my travel altar and why do I want one and then how to customize it really is what you need to do to take those ones you purchased and then make them fulfilling for your own spiritual path. The analogy is it's kind of like walking into a store and seeing an amazing outfit on a mannequin and buying everything right off the mannequin and expecting it to fit you perfectly. It's a great start for a good outfit because that's why it's on the mannequin, but you gotta expect to do some tailoring it to really make it meaningful to you. Okay, all right, so back to me, right? Who am I? This was me, expanded Christian tradition, recovering SAT tutor, thrift store fashionista. So now we're gonna start the process of figuring this out for you. And this is on the worksheet, so we can start now, but if you email me or you sign up on my mail list for the worksheet, you'll be able to look at it more. Who are you? Okay, step zero. So what is your faith and belief foundation that you want to work through? If you have gods or goddesses you love that you want to, you want to, you know, patronize, if you have some background, what is your growth and healing zone? And by that, I mean, I want to overcome childhood trauma. I want to get better direction on my spiritual path. I want to have more empathy for others. Where are you seeing you want to move forward? And then joy and satisfaction triggers are like, what do I just like? What makes me happy? So question one, how are you gonna fulfill your faith and belief foundation? Two, how are you going to nurture? Hello? Is it not updating? Can you see this? How will I nurture this at the bottom? Okay, good. How will I nurture this? your growth and healing zone. And then three, how are you going to incorporate your joy and satisfaction triggers? Whatever those are. So I tried to get it down to three. Foundation belief, growth and healing, joy and satisfaction. How are you gonna incorporate that stuff in your travel altar? Okay, now the practicals are, where do I wanna go with my travel altar and how am I traveling? Ta-da! The table that will help you figure out what to contain your travel altar in. So if you're traveling on foot, 
like hiking or walking in the park, you need something pretty small, like a mint tin, or maybe a little um, jewelry box or something like that. And it could be, I need something that fits in my jeans pocket. Some people who are backpacking maybe just need something that fits in a backpack. If you're traveling on the plane, you probably want something that's gonna fit in um, a suitcase or a carry-on, so like a cigar box. Um, when I say cigar box, I mean like cigar box size. I'm not advocating smoking or saying that you should go buy a cigar box, but this is the, the size. If you're traveling by car, you're like going on a road trip or you're visiting a friend, then you're looking at something that's kind of like shoebox size. And it's perfectly fine to have multiple travel alters because of course a mint tin will fit inside a cigar box, which will then fit inside a shoebox. So you might end up with like the Russian nested dolls of travel alters, depending on what kinds of trips you're taking. So once you've chosen your container, then we need a list of preferred activities. What do you want to do with your travel alter? Just the way if you're going on a hiking trip, you're like, I'm going to hike. I got to pack my hiking boots. If you like rituals, then you need your ritual objects. And remember I said we talk about the buttons. These buttons represent the four elements, the water, earth, air, and fire. And I put them at the corners of my travel altar when I do a reading as I'm helping to set my sacred space. So I have my ritual elements. That could include, you know, sage for smudging, if that's what you like, something to cast a sacred circle. Um, connection, is there some sort of divine devotional object that you need or something that symbolizes your spirit guides or who you're connecting with? Um, some sort of divination objects, these are some little, um, uh, astrological divination shells that I painted, but you might have cards or a pendulum or whatever it is. Somebody asked me at one point about what to do with creating a travel altar for protection in the car. And so this is this is where if your travel altar has a specific purpose, a car protection purpose, you would be thinking, what am I going to put in that's going to fulfill this purpose? So like this thing here, this is called the eyes. So it's actually a protection symbol. So you could put protection symbols in there. Or you could say, well, in order to be protected in the car, I need to be alert as I drive. I've got to be focused. I've got to stay calm. And then you could put things in that helped you stay focused and calm and alert while you're driving. I do not want to imply that if you put a protection altar in your car, that you will never in your life ever have an accident. I can't guarantee what spirit has in store for you or that you're going to stay awake. But it was a great example of like very specific, narrow altars for a specific purpose. And I thought that was really cool. Okay, the next step is to get some inspiration. Um, if you type in like travel altar tour on YouTube, there's amazing videos. If you type in how to make a travel altar on an internet search, there's tons of examples. Of course, we want to connect with our divine connection and meditate. What do I want out of my travel altar? What I think would be cool. This is a photo that Nisha, who's here today with us, thank you, Nisha, posted. And you can see she's got one of these great uh, grids which was made by um, Amanda and Jody. And this is not a travel altar per se, but there's plenty of great stuff here that could be in a travel altar, like these little tokens that she has, which are very small and portable and could totally go into a travel altar. So I thought that there was a lot of great inspiration here. Um, whoops, that was the wrong way. Okay, here we go. I loved the bottles in this particular altar. Um, this altar just had a great feel. It was super colorful, but the whole idea of having like individually labeled bottles, like if Ari has her little, um, her essential oils and she wanted to make teeny tiny bottles for them, I thought that that was great inspiration. Um, this is a crystal grid and you can see there's a little mouse here holding a heart. My personal belief is that there's no need to be too serious when you're connecting with your divine. And if a little mouse with a heart makes you happy or you want to incorporate kids toys whatever helps you cement that divine connection is good um and then uh the other day i woke up and i found this on the kitchen counter which is a used tea bag that my husband had made me tea with and it just happened it was just staring at me and i was like this is perfect for my travel altar the whole thing is about inch high so I just took the pears and cut it off and stuck it in my travel altar because I'm so often outdoors in the park. And I thought this is really cool inspiration. So definitely don't think that the only source of ideas is your own brain or whatever you hear from spirit on the inside, because I really feel like looking outside for inspiration is a great way to, to get ideas for what you can put in your travel altar. Um, okay, 
So here's an optional step, but I think it's very cool, which is how do you want to feel? To think about the overall impression of your altar. And I do this with images because my altar is so tiny that I don't have a lot of room for stuff. So what I do is in the lid, you, see, you can see um, there's a, a piece of cardboard and I just found this like beautiful, cool, blingy photo of a gorgeous shoe with crystals on it and cut it out because I love the contrast between the beautiful photo and like the desert background. Sometimes I feel like a desert inside and I'm like, nothing good is growing in me. And I loved the idea that this beautiful shoe could flourish. So I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna stick this image in my travel altar. This is on the back side of my casting cloth. Um, but sometimes I wanna feel like all cosmic-y and mystical. So I have another image. This is um, the distribution of dark matter in the universe. And my mother's a scientist who worked on dark matter. So every time I look at this, I think, oh, I'm, cha I'm channeling mom, but in my own way. So if you have images that are really meaningful to you, those are a great thing to include. And you can just like paste them in the lid or on the bottom, they hardly take up any space, but this helps boost the feeling of your travel altar so that you're in the right mood when you get to the actual activity. Um, all right, anybody have anything they wanna ask or mention or should I keep going? The tea bag has an owl. Wow. I didn't even notice that. Misha said, yes, images of ancestors. Thank you for mentioning that. I meant to suggest that. So not the original image maybe, but you could get a photocopy made or take a photo and print it out. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Okay. So I think I have a how-to. Oh, that's the, that's the end image which you saw. So here's how I did this, just so you know. So the first thing I did is I traced the outline of my tin onto a cardboard drink box. And I just traced it around the outline and then I cut it out and made sure that it, it fit. And then here's my, my crafter trick. So oops, you can see that when I cut out the, the uh, box here, sorry, when I cut out this piece, there was like the outline was left over around the edge, but there was a cut here because obviously I had cut into it to cut out the piece. So what I did is I taped it back together and then I had a shape that looked like the outline. And then I just moved it around on the image until I had it centered. And then I just traced around the inside of the image. And then I glued it on with some double-sided tape and the glue stick. That's the how-to. And then, and actually you can see the casting cloth is right here, which is where I use my mini rune set. We'll get to that in just a moment. I'll show it to you. Um, and so this is the backside of the casting cloth. So if I'm not casting, just leave it with the shoe side up and it's inspiring to me because I, I just love shoes. <laughs> all right, anyway, that's how that one worked. Okay, so once you've got all your tools, here are the steps for trying to actually pack it into this tiny box. So step one, ask the universe for help. And we're gonna add Jilly's gratitude. Thank you universe for giving me all these, these things. Yes, post-it glue would be great to, to glue the, the image on. So ask the universe for help in fitting everything in. Step two is to downsize. Maybe this is not the time to use your huge two inch long pendulum that you love. Maybe this is the time to ask the universe for a teensy tiny pendulum that will fit. Um, maybe you can uh, take your big casting cloth and make a smaller version of it. Okay. Seek mini versions. There are cool versions of like mini tarot cards, mini oracle cards. There are all kinds of tiny things that you can see. And if you type in, travel altar supplies in a Google search. There's lots of Etsy artists that are selling tiny versions of things, little bottles for salt and essential oil. Pack and unpack. It may take you a few goes. Um, the lid to my mint tin is held on with a um, rubber band <laughs> because I packed so much stuff in there. So, And then this is the key thing, is to make sure that you try your travel altar out before you take your massive trip. So pretend you're on your trip and especially like if you're going to Europe or, you know, you're going like on a big trip, fingers crossed, we will all someday be able to go on big trips again. Take, try the travel altar out. Yeah, do a few like practice, practice rituals that you can do and just see how you feel about it. A lot of times, you know, there'll be things where you're like, well, this part worked great, but I folded up my casting cloth. And then when I tried to unfold it, it wasn't flat. So I couldn't cast on it anymore. Like those, those little sorts of things that you need, make sure that you're practicing it. Okay. Um, all right, so, okay, that looks like, so the next step is we're gonna do a quick tour of my travel altar, just so you can get some ideas. 
Anybody want to say anything or ask anything? Okay. All right, so here's my travel altar. And I'm not at all saying this because my travel altar is like the end all and be all of every travel altar ever. It's just to give you guys some ideas. And I'm just gonna hold it up here so you can see on my screen. Here it is. There's the casting cloth. There's the rune sets. There's the stuff in the middle. So remember I said I wanted something that would fit in the pocket of my jeans. So that's why I chose this particular, this particular box. All right, so what's in it? What's in it? Here we go. Oops, yeah. Okay. So anyway, this is the picture of all the stuff in the bottom. Oops. There we go. Okay. So I've got a bunch of objects that I found. So I've got some clear quartz and some Apache's tears. I don't have tons of crystals in here because it's pretty small, but these two cover the, the gamut for me. And the little shell, anything with an F in it is something that I picked up from the environment. I really like picking things up in the environment and adding them to my travel altar because it makes me feel more connected to nature. But also I feel like these are gifts that my divine connection has given to me. And so I'm like, thank you. Thank you for giving me this beautiful shell. So when I walk by the river, sometimes I wanna dip a little bit of water out of the river. Uh, and that's why the shell is here. Um, I think I also have this bottle cap because I like to do casting in the lid, but the lid doesn't sit flat when I open it. it it goes down and then the casting cloth doesn't work. So I have the bottle cap as a way to prop it up to keep it level. So that's the kind of mechanical thing you figure out when you actually try to use your 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 uh, uh, your altar. OK, so I've got an athame. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, this is like a ritual knife and I don't actually use mine for any rituals. What I do is I use it for drawing runes in the sand or on the riverbank. So for me, it's really a drawing tool. I've got a little pendulum. That's this thing on a chain here. You can see it's kind of at the edge. It looks, it's, just, it's basically a crystal pendant that I got from my sister and I put it on a chain. Um, the casting cloth is this background that the runes are on. Um, you can see the astro dice right here. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I'll show you how I made it. Um, I've got a set of Lenormand and rune cards, which I'll demo in just a second. And then I have a pencil and paper because sometimes something comes to me and I just want to take some notes and write a few things down and I wanted that to be there. Okay, then I have, these are my rune sacred space buttons. I showed you guys those earlier. These are just some vintage buttons that I painted runes on, but you could cut out little pieces of paper or maybe if there's something else for your sacred space. Um, I have the buttons that represent the four elements. And then those images, which I didn't put in this picture because I couldn't fit everything in the picture, but you guys saw those easier. That's like the one with the shoe on it that gives me the right kind of feel. Um, and I also have a little tiny bottle of salt, which I don't actually take out of the bottle because I don't want to introduce salt into the natural environment because I'm always outside. But it's there from kind of a like, you know, just to remind me to make sure that I'm cleansing things off and setting, setting my protection. Um, yeah, so that's layer one. And then I have, this is this miniature rune set. These are some tiny shells and you can see this is a quarter for scale. And then I crocheted this bag. Um, so when I wanna do a rune casting, these all go on the casting cloth that was in the previous thing. So you can see there they are. This is an astrological casting cloth I created. It's got 12 divisions and they basically match with the 12 signs, health, the 12 houses in astrology. So when like this house, this rune here landed in the 10th house, so I would think that this rune has to do with my career. Or these runes landed in the fifth house, so I would think that those runes have to do with creativity. And actually on my rune class, we're going to talk about this in greater detail and we have a sample casting that we're going to be practicing reading. But anyway, that does work. Okay, so I have the mini rune set. Then I have this set of mini cards, which I'm going to show you how to make in just a second. But these are rune cards, Pusark runes, and witch runes. And they go in this little red bag. There's a quarter there. Uh, you can see the size. Then I have this divination dice set that I created. And if we have time, I can show you how to make this. But I'm thinking of doing a separate ebook on how to make this. These are basically some important words 
to me and then I roll the dice to see which words spirit wants me to be thinking about like for that day. And then there's there's a close up of the divination dice. This is just a square wooden bead that I found in my bead stash. And then I painted numbers on it and I also painted little mini mini um uh astrologicals so I can roll it and get some astrology input if I want. Um, you guys have probably figured out that I love making tiny things. Not everybody does. It's not necessary to be an enthusiast for making tiny things to have a travel altar because you can always patronize Etsy um, or I can make something tiny for you. But I just thought I'd show you the amount of tiny things you can fit into a mint tin is pretty amazing. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. So I started out using the bottle cap. Somebody said, Misha said, I thought maybe you were using um, a bottle cap to hold water during casting. But the problem is that I put my rune buttons back in the bottle cap to keep them um, corralled and I don't want to get them wet. So that's why I use the shell for holding water during casting and not the bottle cap. You are clearly paying attention, my friend. Yeah. And you said it's, it's a hard A, Athem, Athame? Athame. Is the Athame, harmony at the you. end of Athame. Athame. Great. Thank you for telling me how to how to pronounce that. Ritual I just is not my heard it from a, a Wiccan high priestess is all. So I don't know if they're pronouncing it okay. correctly or not. So I don't know. Well, I think she has more authority than I do, so I'm willing to go with Athame until otherwise. Uh, that's all, that's your, your... where I got it from, so I don't know. Great, thank you. Thank you for chiming in. Okay. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Okay. All right. So this is how to make your own set of mini cards. Should you want to do that? So the first thing I did was cut out uh, some little squares out of another drink box. I like reusing things, but you could use you know um, any cardboard you wanted to. And I think I just used a ruler and cut up like one inch divisions. These are like one inch by a half inch. All right, then I painted Lenormand card symbols on them. Now that's not something everybody feels good about doing, but you can just write the name of the Lenormand cards because Lenormand cards don't need art. So you could just write the name with like a Sharpie or a ballpoint pen if you wanted to. And then on the flip side, I was like, well, I have blank backs, so I might as well put something else on. So I put on a set of runes, but there are 41 cards and only 24 runes. So I had a bunch of leftover ones. So I put on a set of witch runes. Now I don't consider myself to be a witch, but I believe, hopefully I'm not offending anybody, that witch runes can be used by those who are not witches. Uh, if you're interested in witch runes, you can just Google witch runes and there's lots of information. So basically I ended up with three divination systems in one like little tiny bag, which made my inner heart happy. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there's a little bag. You can see there's a ruler down there for the scale. Okay, so what I discovered making my own altar is that I'm super interested in divination. And this is part of why making a travel altar is useful because you learn a lot about yourself when you figure out what are those essential things that I really want to pack. I have some stuff for ritual, which I don't use that much, some stuff for connection, which I like, but I just, I'm always using it for divination. And so that was really valuable for me to realize that actually I'm connecting not so much with my, my divine connection, but I'm connecting with my inner self. And it really helps me build that part of my practice. And that's, you know, again, partly why these things are valuable. Okay, so wrapping up, keys to success. Identify your goals. It's perfectly fine if your goals change. You're not setting your goals forever. Your altar is not cast in stone, carved in stone. But you got to have some goals for what you are looking to achieve in order to get an altar that really fits with your spiritual path. Be flexible about how you achieve them. I know you love your giant set of full-size tarot cards, and nobody's saying you can't enjoy those. But if they don't fit into your mint tin, be flexible in terms of coming up with another way to, to enjoy that activity. And then pair things down. You might be like, but what if I wanna do this? And what if I wanna do that? Not everything has to fit in your travel altar all at once. It turns out that actually all of those divination systems don't all fit in the travel altar at the same time. I can either take the Lenormand cards 
or I can take the runes. And I just make a decision when I go on a hike, which one I want to use. So it's perfectly fine if you have multiple options and you can do what museums call a rotating collection, where you rotate them through your travel altar. But you got to be willing to see that these limitations are actually helping you. Like, how is this a productive thing? Instead of bemoaning the loss of every one of your 6,000 crystals. Um, and then ditch the mistake mindset. This is not something where you're going to make a horrible mistake and ruin your life. You, you've just got to be willing to give it a try and know that you're going to adjust as you go. And it's perfectly fine to switch out, have one altar for like, you know, family vacations and a totally different one for your hike in the park because your spiritual needs might be different in those two places. But just by getting in, it's kind of like learning to cook. You got to get in there, get your hands dirty, make a mess and, um, and enjoy the the process of being able to get closer to your divine connection. And these things at the bottom are just a few more room buttons that I that I painted because I liked that they were gold and blue, <laughs> like the background. Um, but yeah, and then you know you may make things that don't even work out, and you have to go back to the drawing board and make something else, and that also would be fine. Okay, I think. Let's see. Oh, right. So here's the worksheet I made for you guys. It's a two page worksheet. Um, and you can find it if you go to my website, Spirit Said. Looks like there's an extra space in there, but it should just be all one thing, spiritsaid.com. If you sign up for my mailing list, you will automatically get the worksheet. If you don't want to sign up for my mailing list, I totally understand. You can email me and say, please send me the travel altar worksheet and I will email it to you. Um, I do, however, um, I'm putting out some other uh, like classes, more free classes, and then I'm trying to do an ebook about things. So if you want to be on the list for uh, for getting any of that, you can sign up for the mailing list for that too. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the things that are on here are related to the stuff that we've been talking about today. Plus, there's extra lists of goodies that you could be thinking about. And then the other thing is I put together a map your spiritual adventurer quiz. And this is a quiz that allows you to figure out what it is that you really are enjoying on spiritual adventure and some areas that maybe are not so strong for you, which you might decide to work on. There are four different types. And for each type, I have material about the strengths, the challenges, chakras and crystals, their customized recommendations. So if you go to my website, there's a button in the upper right that says to the quiz. It's a yellow button and it will take you to this quiz. Um, and then also you can sign up and get on the waitlist for this ebook that I'm writing, which is nine weeks to spiritual transformation. It's going to be a pay what you can, but the suggested donation is $7. So I'm trying to make it affordable for everybody. And, um, and I'm hoping you guys will enjoy this quiz and I'd love to get feedback on it. It's brand new. So I'm very interested in what people think about the quiz and whether it was helpful and, and what you're thinking. Okay, so again, website www spirit said and there's a button to the quiz in the upper right. Very cool. And Robin, can you tell us what other because you do all sorts of different kinds of readings and cool things. So can you tell us a little bit about those two? Sure. So um, I also do uh, mythological astrology readings, where we find the mythological figures who are in important places in your astrology chart and we look at the stories from those mythologies to get insight and cautions and advice for your life. I do rune training for working on how to use runes to transform your spiritual path. And I also um, do something called Lenormand card life mapping, which is a special type of Lenormand card reading where you arrange the cards in a three by three grid and the position of the cards in the grid shows you what aspect of your issue they apply to. So there's like a past, present, future, and then like a surface, middle, and foundation level. And then there's the heart of the matter, and then there's the outcome. And you basically read where they are by using the Lenormand cards as a, as a map. It's really cool. It's like a 19th century thing. So Very yeah, cool. I do Thank all those you. as well. All right. Uh, does anyone have any questions as we wrap things up here? I'm gonna try to go through everyone. Anyone have any? Nope. We got some hearts going on here. Okay, Jilly, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm flipping through everybody. So. Okay. 
Jilly said she got a mythological astrology reading and it was amazing and insightful, which is amazing. Yes, it sounds very Yay. cool. Uh, <laughs> so I love that. And Robin was one of the practitioners in our recent 1111 event and um, donated a portion of our sales to Awkwardly Zen. So we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, we love to support our own here. So if you have the the need to find some of those things out, or if you were like, that is really cool, let's all support one another because that's awesome. Um, and especially our practitioners here, they give us a lot of love and do a lot of work. And that presentation was beautiful, Robin. Um, all right. Well, if there's no questions, Robin, I'm going to have you unshare your screen just so I can see everyone again, please. Okay. I do have a little bit of bonus material if oh, okay. people for want sure. to share for anything else, but I can stop sharing the screen if you want to look at people. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any questions. No hands are being missed. Are you pretty proud there, Dad? Woohoo! She's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I don't understand all the material, but I absolutely love the presentation and the slide graphics. I, I see lots of presentations in my work. I never see any of them as pretty as Robin, frankly. It's amazing. Ah, uh, yay. Uh, love that dad love there. Awesome. <laughs> uh, all right. So no questions there. So what else did you want to share with them, Robin, before I go over all the other details? Um, well, we have seven minutes. How many minutes do you need? I need at least three. Okay, why don't you take your three, and if we have a tiny moment, I have one more how-to. You go, go for it. Go for it. Okay. I, I have, I have faith. We'll, we'll both get everything we need. All right. So I thought I would just show you guys because I wasn't sure how long my presentation was going to go. How to make those little divination dice system, which I just created. So basically, what I did is I cut out words that were meaningful to me from a couple of magazines that I had my parents save. These were fashion magazines, high fashion magazines. So there was a lot of like, kind of um, like uh, very dramatic ad copy in these. So I just went through and I cut out in a very like intuitive way, everything that seemed cool and interesting. And then I arranged them on the background of some sort of um, a picture that felt evocative to me in a certain way. And then I cut out those two backgrounds the same way that I showed you guys, where I traced around the tin and then I used the outline to like center on the, on the, on the image. And then I just glued it onto these two backgrounds that I cut out of cardboard. And then I glued all of the words onto the background. And so the way it works is I roll the dice twice and add the numbers they're 12 by the way on each of these because it's a six-sided dice so i roll it twice and then like if i roll a two and a three i'm like okay that's five so then i count down one two three four five and i'm like okay want i'm supposed to be thinking about what i want and then i roll it again and i count down the same number on the second one and and i i did one right before this talk because i was feeling kind of nervous and i got unleash greek mythological figure and i was like what does that mean <laughs> and i heard this voice in my head that said aphrodite and i was like i'm supposed to unleash aphrodite on the people in my class and the voice said just show them how much you love them and you're going to be fine and i was like oh that was so nice so that was the inspiration that i got from uh I got from uh, from spirit using my 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 uh, my divination dice. But anyway, so I just thought I would I would demo that because again, it's a divination system that uses up almost no space because these are so thin and it's just a tiny dice. And of course, you don't have to do twelve if you have dice that are other shapes. If you had eight sided dice, you could do sixteen. So, all right, that's the end. That's all the material I've got for you guys. But thank you so much for giving me a chance to share and for coming to my class. Hearts. Absolutely. That's for you guys too. Let's all send some love great. to Robin and all the work she did. It's beautiful. Uh, and uh, just want to real quick go over, Robin, I'm going to have you, un there you go, perfect. Um, there are quite a few fun things coming up. This, uh, we've got Sophia's uh, Zen Zoom tomorrow at two. If you've never been to a Friday afternoon Zen Zoom, they're a lot of fun. They're a bit of a party. And then Saturday, we have the uh, intuitive eye reading class, um, which is very, very cool. And she's going to even do some examples for us. And uh, I've had 
uh, a taste of that myself, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, on Sunday, we are celebrating one of our own. Um, our friend Kat Barron has just put out her second book, and so we are having a book release party for her on Sunday. So come share some love. She's going to do some readings out of it. Um, it's called embracing awkward, which seems appropriate, right? Uh, and then next week we have all of our Zen Zooms. We have a lot more classes coming up. I just scheduled a bunch of stuff. I shouldn't say I did. Sophia just scheduled a bunch of stuff um, for us later on in the month. So make sure you're keeping track of the meetup page. For those of you who came because you're friends with Robin and you got your, your um, email from her, you can go to awkwardlyzen.com and find out about all of our events or join one of our Awkwardly Zen um, meetup groups. We have nine of them, but they're all the same right now. So just join the one that's closest to you. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight and Robin for all the work that you did and uh, have a fabulous evening. Sending love to all of you and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Robin, can you stay on for just a second? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thank you. Special thank you to my dad for joining us. Yay. <laughs> that was awesome. That was lovely. Yep. Bye, guys. My mom wanted to come too, but she had a scientific meeting and couldn't miss it. So damn science. Oh. Harry, stop recording. Oh, thank you. As I say, damn science. <laughs> Seems appropriate.